Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the November 23rd meeting of uh, Trent Hills Council. I'll call the meeting to order at 9.33 a.m. This council meeting is being conducted in person and members in council are pre present in the council chambers. At this time, in-person attendance by members of the public is not permitted. The meeting is being live streamed on the municipality's meeting portal and YouTube channel. The video recording will be uploaded to the municipality of Trent Hills website following the meeting. With the adoption of the agenda, be resolved that the agenda for the council meeting on November the 23rd, 2021, be received and adopted. Can I get a mover and seconder, please? Moved by Jean, seconded by Kathy. All in favor, that motion is carried. Is there any disclosure of uh, pecuniary interest? Seeing none, should it arise, please uh, notify the clerk. Uh, we are <clears throat> now at minutes of advisory of council and advisory bodies. The minutes of the council meeting held on November the 9th, 2021, be resolved that the minutes of the council meeting held on November the 9th, 2021, be received and adopted as presented. A mover and seconder for that, please. All in favor? Sorry, I should have asked. Any discussion on that? Yes, Gene. We had quite a discussion on the free services portion of the speech. Councillor, can you please turn on your microphone so the cameras can follow you? We're on. Okay, I'll start again. Uh, Mr. Chairman, at the PSB meeting, uh, there was quite a discussion about the information was coming out from the Black Cat report, and which is very helpful when we get the, the report. Since that time, I've had a uh, rate pair on, on Mahoney Road quite query me about uh, speeding on that road, and I said, it's too bad you didn't call me a week earlier, but I think Neil Allenson is being asked to set up a schedule for more Black Cat installations in the future. Hopefully we could add Mahoney Road to that and uh, see just how, how fast they are driving on that. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Gene. The, um, yeah, I, I believe now we, we have um, the ability to do more roads. We did... Um, uh, we have purchased a couple extra machines, so we uh, will put that on the uh, agenda. Yeah, and um, I will. So I'll call the question on the on the um, minutes. All in favor? That's carried. And <clears throat> the next uh, item, the. Um, Minutes for the public hearing public meetings which were held on November the 2nd, 2021, and for the Police Services Board meeting held on November the 16th, 2021. Be resolved that the minutes of the public hearings, public meetings held on November the 2nd, 2021, Police Services Board meeting held on November the 16th, 2021, be received. A mover and seconder for that, please. Moved by Ken, seconded by Gene. And uh, Gene will include your comments with uh, regards to Mahoney Road on this report. And uh, any anything further on that? Yes. Just a question in, in light of the fact that there was an extensive discussion. Do we get some kind of a, a summary or a report sort of that goes through in, in maybe after all of this is done or at a certain point? after a number of roads have been done, sort of concluding. I know there's, a, there's some information later on in the meeting to show the exact report, but, but does somebody sit down and, and go through the details of this and come up with some suggestions or summaries for council or staff? Yeah, I believe that all the reports go to, uh, to Neil. Um, and then, um, you know, the decisions are made on where we're going, Doug. Would you add to that? Uh, yes, Your Worship. The uh, Black Cat reports, along with the radar reports that are now handled through the new devices, are all distributed to the OPP to assist them in determining targeted enforcement. Um, the request for the replacements or for the placement of the Black Cat and the radar devices 
are funneled through NEO, and NEO will arrange for the deployment of them, but all the reports go as soon as they're done out to OPP to assist them, and then the summary reports come forward to PSB and subsequently over to uh, Council's agendas, um, which was part of the traffic calming recommendations from earlier this year. Of, of Councillor Bratney's inquiry, if, if individuals are speaking to members of Council, um, do they get or can we access that summary to, or should we just refer um, citizens on to staff or police or if there's an inquiry like the Mahoney Road, what, what would be best for councillors to do? I can speak to that, sorry. Um, that's exactly what should be done. Um, they can be forwarded on to staff because as um, Doug said, Neil sort of has all that information and it's ultimately uh, his department that determines the placement of the machines. So if there's an issue, then you need to alert us to it and then we'll put it in the queue and schedule it accordingly depending on the, the complaint and whatnot. And then that data then goes to uh, the OPP and the summary report will come forward to council after PSB has reviewed it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I was gonna wait till the consent agenda to discuss this, but I guess we're discussing it now. Uh, the 13th, there seems to be problems on it, real problems on it. I just wondered, uh, what, how, what's the follow up on that? It was in the police report, the 13th. Maybe Ken or Jean could answer that better, maybe. And uh, the OPP have uh, put somebody to, to target that road and, and, and beef up enforcement on that road because it showed that the speeding was uh, in the moderate to high range. So it is being uh, on the agenda for follow up. So. Um, in that area, it's, it's a 70 zone, I believe, where, where they were sitting up. And then there's 15 uh, grace period on top of that, so that gets you at 85. So then when you get that failure rate over the 85, you know, that tells you a lot of them are hitting 100. That's it's just not, uh, not just a slow pace to trigger in the, the radar, you know. So maybe they will get the books out and write them, write them up more vigorously. Thank you. Thank you. So, any further on that? All in favor? That's carried. Uh, we're at deputations. <clears throat> we have uh, Bill Russell, United Empire Loyalists Association of Canada. Um, Bill, you have a presentation? I do. I do. Should I proceed now? Yes, please. Okay. Um, good morning, Mayor Craig, council members. Thank you for allotting me uh, time for my presentation today. I'd like to speak about the United Empire Loyalist Grave Marker Program. We recently gave an in-depth presentation at the Campbellford Seymour Historical Society. I'd like to thank the council members who attended. I'd also like to thank Karen and Aaron, staff members, mm -hmm. who have greatly assisted me in verifying the interred veterans in the local cemeteries. The grave marking project began in 2014 in Brant County. The local historical society wanted to honor the War of 1812 veterans buried in a local cemetery. The media covered the event and the people and organizations started inquiring if they could hold similar events in their cemeteries. The Brant Historical Society, realizing they did not have the resources, asked the United Empire Loyalist Association of Canada to help identify the veterans interred in these cemeteries. These veterans and loyalists were the first Canadian settler group to form militias in Upper Canada. These brave men repelled the American invasion 
1812, many losing their lives protecting their new homeland. And they have totally gone unforgotten. Uh, there is a program called No Stone Left Unturned, or uh, Left Alone, but they only recognize the veterans after the 1867. So we're honoring the first veterans. Uh, this is the first time that we would hold a ceremony in Northumberland County. We've done similar ceremonies locally in Quinty West, Hastings and Lennox and Addington counties and the city of Kingston. In the past summer, we did two in Bath, Ontario and one in Stockdale, Ontario and Quinty West. This, is, this quest has taken hundreds of hours of research and as to date, we've honored over 300 veterans. We're asking council's permission to hold the ceremony in Warkworth, June 18th, 2022. This will be a heritage event and we will invite the public to participate. We are inviting local service groups, school children and the Legion to partner with us. The Warkworth Library has agreed to put up a display of the War of 1812 two weeks prior to our ceremony to promote the event. We'll be having 50 reenactor soldiers coming from across Ontario to participate, along with 20 local army cadets from Campbellford and area. Um, we will purchase lunches, signs, and sign markers locally, and the reenactors will be bringing, and the cadets will be bringing their families along with the guests, and they will be shopping at local merchants in Warkworth thus an economic boost to local merchants. There is no cost to the municipality other than we would ask that the staff install the grave marker sign at Stone Cemetery, and we would ask council to send a representative that day. So I will entertain any questions from council. Thank you very much. Council, any questions for uh, Mr. Russell? Rick? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks very much, Bill, for your presentation. And you've done a great job on, uh, I think it was last Monday night as well. Um, you mentioned Thank a sign you. in Stone Cemetery. Was there going to be one in Morocco Cemetery as well? No, uh, we've uh, determined there are two original um, United Empire Loyalists buried at Stone Cemetery, a Michael Kreiderman and a Cornelius Oliver. So they were the original land grant holders given by the government for for uh, supporting the British in the war of eight or the war of independence in the state so they're the only two now Warkworth Cemetery and we're also doing Crammy Hills Cemetery that day also and we've already received permission for that um, but um, we have lots of sons and daughters of loyalists buried but we want to recognize that it is a loyalist burial ground and there are people that uh, do tours, touring loyalist burial grounds and recording the people. So it would also be a bit of a tourist draw too. Okay, Bill, uh, Kathy. Oh, thank you. Um, I'd just like to, um, to say that uh, Bill and I had quite an extensive conversation about this. I am familiar with the reenactments and I'm wondering if uh, perhaps there would be an opportunity to maybe even expand on the weekend and uh, if there was plans for a camp out of some sort, um, they've done it in other areas or whether it's sort of a one in and a one out and we could build on that at another time. Uh, they actually are camping out, but they will be camping out in Adolphus Town okay. um, at the uh, United Empire Loyalty uh, Loyalist Heritage Centre on Lake Ontario, just across the bay from Picton. So they will be camping there Friday night and coming to Warkworth. And then they have to go back because they have a ceremony there at Adolphus Town on Sunday that they're doing. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, I, and I'd just like to say that I'm really pleased to see that the, um, the library is stepping forward and perhaps some other organizations or some of the businesses um, could um, participate. We've got lots of lead-in time. Unfortunately, um, Councillor McLennan and myself were 
at the library meeting that evening, so we couldn't attend the heritage meeting. But, or, or, but um, um, I think there's there's great potential with this to to celebrate uh, local heritage and history. And I just want to thank Bill for the work that he's done so far. I know that he has quite a, a reputation, not only in the area, but across Canada for the work he's doing. So thank you for selecting us. Thank you. Um, I, I am a resident of Warkworth, so I wanted to bring it to Northumberland first. In my studies so far in, in Northumberland County, I found around 115 War of 1812 veterans and loyalists buried, mostly along the lake shore because that's where they settled first. But, um, and as to uh, bringing other groups into this, um, I'm hoping to, but I didn't want to contact anyone until I had council's permission to hold the event. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Councillor Brahany? Canadians Sorry, don't know our, know our history as well as our American friends do. And uh, the War of 1812 was uh, well documented that day. The, really and truly your cohort, Bill, was, uh, he's, it's, his, it's his forte, I guess, to know all that. And he's, he certainly puts all his effort into this presentation. Thank you for being there. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Well, again, thanks, Bill, very much for the presentation. Um, <clears throat> I, I missed your event. I'm hope I, I will be there for the 18th. I, I put it in my calendar this morning. So, um, but I, I um, uh, I've been reading some sort of fictional, fictional history on the War of 1812. There's some books written uh, by an author down in uh, Niagara on the Lake. Written four books. And uh, I've read them all, and it, it's uh, very interesting, and it sure brings things into focus when you uh, read them. I will uh, I'll read the resolution. <clears throat> Be resolved that the information presented by Bill Russell, United Empire Loyalist Association of Canada, we request to erect a sign and hold a ceremony on June the 18th, 2022, to recognize the War of 1812 veterans be received. That request to erect United Empire Loyalist burial ground signage at the Warkworth and Stones cemeteries be approved, that the request to conduct a graveside ceremony for the War of 1812 veterans at the Warkworth and Stones cemeteries on Saturday, June the 18th, 2022 be approved, and that should the applicant desire the use of a cannon during the graveside ceremony, separate request for an exemption of the municipality's uh, noise bylaw be submitted to council for consideration. Mover, uh, Rick would move. Ken would second. Any discussion? All in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much, and thanks again, Bill. Uh, could I just ask a question? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, sorry, I did. I forgot all about the cannon part of it. Uh, the cannon is used at the end of the ceremony. Uh, we'll be doing Warcourt Cemetery and then Stones and then break for the day and then go to Crammy Hills. Uh, the cannons fired three times at the end of the ceremony. So be three times in Warkworth, three times at Stones. And we've used the cannon in every ceremony we've done so far. So would we have to apply for an exemption or is that automatically granted in this motion? Uh, through your worship to um, Mr. Russell, uh, yes, the municipality will require a separate uh, request. Um, and if you just want to reach out to the clerk's office, we can work through the wording of that request and it'll come forward. It shouldn't mm -hmm. be an issue, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. And would I need to be present or do I just send the proposal in? It can just be a written uh, proposals or written requests, sir. There's no need, and um, the meeting will be live streamed. Okay. At the clerk's office. You can contact either myself, Doug Irwin, or Karen Frigo, the deputy clerk. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all. So, as the date has the date been approved. 
Yes, the date's been approved. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank Look you. Look forward to seeing everyone there. That's great. Have a good day. Uh, all, in all in favor of the motion? That's carried. Thank you. Thank we you. Uh, we now have uh, Heather Haldane, Southeastern Ontario Production Accelerator Fund. Heather? Yes, hi. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Um, I've sent along um, a bit of an overview on the COPATH presentation, and that stands for the Southeastern Ontario Production Accelerator Fund. Um, it's a proposal that a, a volunteer working committee and myself have put together. Um, uh, really, it started in the time of COVID um, and it's continued forward. Um, it's a proposal to bring, to encourage um, and accelerate more production in the Southeastern Ontario region. Um, and it's really modeled on a fund that operates similarly in the North, which many people I find don't really know that much about. Um, and that is a is a film stream fund that operates within the Northern Ontario, NOHFC, Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, something or other. I always forget what the acronyms stand for, but um, it's been operating for over 20, well, close to 20 years. I shouldn't say over 20 years, close to 20 years this fund in the north it's brought business to the north it's not only brought business but it's grown business there um, because uh, in attracting the film industry to that region there are um, a number of companies that begin to set up and it continues to sort of grow over um, time and resulted in their case in a return on investment um, this is from a study that was done in 2017 by Ontario Creates, which is a government agency for the for the um, uh, production content industry, um, in a in a return on investment of five to one. So for every dollar spent, there was a return of five dollars. Uh, that's approximate, but that's sort of the the top line on this the results of the study. So um, because this working committee, this volunteer working committee, works is in this industry we began to look at this region and the potential for it to attract the same amount and style of business as ha has been able to be attracted in the North and, um, and began to try to figure out how to create a film stream fund. Um, and really what we discovered it's evolved over time is that we feel that there's a great opportunity for this to become a film stream within the Eastern Ontario Development Fund um, and the reason for that is that the mandate is very similar to what this industry would bring. That is in, in terms of job creation and revenue. And it also describes the area that we see this being applied to. So the catchment matches. There's many things that match in this, but um, we're proposing that as in the north it, within this existing fund that a film stream be specially set up. Um, so it's fairly ambitious. Um, uh, we've been spending a lot of time talking. We initially began with MPPs across this region just to sort of sound the idea out to them, um, to hear back about what they thought were maybe assets within their own communities um, and to get a general reaction. Um, I'd say that we've been very successful. For me, this began because I live in the Prince Edward County area um, with Minister uh, Todd Smith coming on board and supporting us pretty much from the get-go and introducing us to other groups across the region that could be helpful. And so in the last year and a half, that's what we're, we've really been doing is reaching out to a range of different groups. Because uh, over time this evolved to us um, sort of, you know, talking about whether it should be a culture or an ec economic development fund, um, we've targeted in this case an economic development fund. But because of that, we've um, begun to realize that the, the that we really then therefore have to speak to Minister Bethlen Falvey and the Premier. And so in, it, we've created this proposal. The full proposal is available on our website, by the way, which is www.scopaf.ca, COPAF, Southeastern Ontario Production Accelerator Fund. 
Um, uh, and so you can read it there, but that proposal sort of evolved then to be to be addressed specifically to the premier in uh, premier minister Bethlen Falvey and um, Minister Fideli in uh, in September of this year. And um, I guess what we've come to realize is, or, or where we're at with it, is that we've got a level of support, but we're really been targeting and reaching out now to municipalities to get them to create letters of support because it will really be important um, when it does get considered uh, within the Ministry of Finance because essentially our conclusion has been that um, within the EODF, there's probably a need to specially set this up, to specially finance it. And so it really will come down to the Minister of Finance and the Premier and all of the um, ministers um, to find a way to see if, if this can be done. Um, that's the ambition. Um, so we have been reaching out to municipalities to say there's a great opportunity here if we can get letters of support addressed to um, the Premier, to Minister Bethlen Falvey, and to Minister Fideli now. Um, we, we, have, we have ourselves um, a call with uh, a senior advisor within the Ministry of Finance this week. We seem to be getting a good reception to um, this proposal and to sort of uh, how it would be set up, and what it would, would uh, how it would benefit this region. Um, and I, I, I'd just like to say one other thing. Um, the overview gives a lot of the sort of, you know, executive summary on, you know, the benefits for this. But um, I want to say that essentially we, part of why we have targeted economic development is that we learned very early on that there has been indeed a government study that's shown that, that Southeastern Ontario as a region is behind in economic growth. And we know that this industry will really benefit this region because we know the industry is interested in this, but it needs that little bit more to get it to actually come to this region. And that's what this fund would do. It would, it would be that little bit more and would we believe operate as successfully here as it does in the North. So that's what I'm here to counsel asking is that that letter of support come from, um, you do it propose uh, do support this proposal um uh, and that that letter would then be directed to the premier and we we'll, you know we have things that will help uh, support who to direct it to um but it, it's important that we do this now because we've been putting this proposal together for a year and a half um we've gotten fairly far through a lot of hard work in terms of our working committee and we feel that with finance looking at it right now we need those letters of support to make a difference in terms of to how the government perceives this and the importance of this um so we have uh, made deputations like this to a number of different municipalities and are hoping that we can get the same level of support from your council um I'm certainly available to answer any questions. Uh, I, before doing that, I just want to mention again that the full proposal is available on the website. Um, anybody can read it. It's you know, pretty in-depth. It gives a list of um, sort of what we see is uh, why why this fund and why this region. It also shows um, some, some of the supporters in our website as well will um, be able to sort of, you know, show the work that we've done to date and give an overview on it as a reference. We actually really recommend that anybody that finds this proposal interesting and um, wants to further support it, that um, we're very open to getting other letters of support. But right now our, our specific target is to be talking to municipalities um, and so that we, we can get those letters sent and prepare and present them at some point in a full file to the government. Um, I think that's that's my overview. Um, if there are, are questions, I'm certainly happy to answer them. I think there's a lot of mystery about this industry and about how to attract it. And what we found is that, um, or what we hear is that people are interested in attracting it to their their city or town, um, but they, they find that they can't do it alone. And we know that. And so what we're saying is do it as a region. We, we'll, we'll create in the end a support organization that will grow out of all of this. There's my phone, I just gotta cancel that. Um, 
we've got a support organization that will grow out of this that many more across the region can get involved in um, and that will target and market this region specifically once this fund is up and operating and that will be how municipalities later can tie in themselves specifically but it doesn't end up um, being more than a letter of support at this point um, so i'm Thank open you. to questions Thank you. Uh, any questions from Council? Okay, if there's no questions, I'll read the uh, resolution. Be resolved that the information presented by uh, Heather Haldane, Southeastern Ontario Production Accelerator Fund, a request for letter of support for SEOPAF be received, and that the letter of support for the Southern Ont Eastern Ontario Production Accelerator Fund be forwarded under the Mayor's signature. Can I get a mover and seconder? Rose and Ken, any discussion? All in favor? That's carried. And uh, thank you very much, and uh, we'll get that letter off to you. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I will, uh, I'll send uh, both a template letter that you can use to, and model your letter from the at email addresses. And I do ask that um, that I be BCC, that's included as well in the letter that will come. But it's just so that we can uh, track and then also make sure that um, we do have the opportunity to later to bring the compiled file of all of the support we we gathered to government. I really appreciate your time and I hope that we get a chance to um, speak about this again. Thank, thank you very much. All Have right. a good day. Bye -bye. Cheers. Uh, we're now uh, at <clears throat> Todd Farrell, Northumberland County. Um, Todd, are you making a presentation? Uh, yes, I am. I can share my screen here, or uh, or you can advance it. Oh, it uh, looks like it's there. Thank you very much. So through you, uh, Your Worship, uh, I'm Todd Farrell. I'm Natural Heritage Manager for Northumberland County. And today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, the forest uh, management plan. It's a 20 year plan from 2021 to 2041. Next slide, please. So first, a little bit of the history. The dark green in the center is the uh, acquisition from 1924. So we're approaching 100 years uh, of the county forest. The gray uh, beyond that and the green is the, uh, is the current boundaries of the county forest. So it spans uh, three townships. Uh, on the, the left-hand side of your screen uh, is uh, the township of Hamilton. Most of the forest is in the center, and that's the township of Alnwick Haldeman. And a small portion on the right is the um, is uh, Crammy Township. Uh, the main road that runs uh, through the center is County Road 45. Uh, off the screen at the bottom would be Coburg, and off the screen at the top uh, would be um, would be Hastings. So we are approaching 100,000 users in the forest. Uh, that's the first time we've reached that value. Uh, so it's not just. Uh, residents of those townships. It's residences of, of Northumberland County and beyond that are using the forest. Next slide, please. So the forest with those 100,000 users is a lot of things to a lot of different people. So these are some of the things that uh, the forest provides, uh, tourism, recreation, air filtration, carbon capture, nature conservation, um, cultural heritage, uh, climate control. So uh, it is a lot of different things. Uh, some people use the forest for certain things, but uh, it's important to keep in mind uh, there is a lot of, uh, the forest means a lot to different people and different things. Next slide, please. So the forest management plan is that 20 year plan. It's a large overarching plan. And um, underneath that, are the operational plans. So the conservation and ecology uh, on the left there, the recreation and the silviculture. So the silviculture is, is the management of, of the, the forest. Uh, we use it for um, the conifer plantations. They were planted in the 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, in that era uh, to prevent erosion. So they're mainly conifer plantations and in rows. So we move them from um, 
a low diversity, low number of species to a high diversity natural forest. And below those are the five-year plans and, and other uh, policies and uh, documents, prescriptions for the forest, standards, uh, our work plans, strategies. Next slide, please. So when developing the, uh, the management plan, it took into account these um, larger considerations. So the long-term thinking, uh, natural and cultural heritage conservation, community engagement, uh, working on those those three zones, making sure that there's synergy between those operating areas, as I mentioned, uh, conservation, recreation, and uh, silviculture, and looking at solutions to known, con known concerns or issues in other community forests and how they've addressed it in other natural areas. Next slide. So the vision is important uh, for the document and for the county forest, so I'll read it. Uh, a county forest where the mosaic of forest, wetland, woodland, savanna, sand barren, and tall grass prairie is a model of multi-use management for the many intrinsic ecological and community benefits. Next slide, please. These are the sections. Uh, I'll specifically in the following slides target and go over uh, goals and actions, but uh, these are all the plan sections within the document um, for um, the forest management plan. Next slide, please. The first goal that we look at is community. Community that is engaged, has pride in and celebrates the Northumberland County Forest for its many values. The first actions, 1A and B, are in conjunction with the Williams Treaty Clause 2 signatories. So uh, working with them with respect to um, the forest and communication, um, and those, are, those sections look at that, uh, uh, preparing a cultural heritage and values document. C is community consultation program. D is our volunteers and looking at um, our volunteer plans and uh, events now and into the future. And E is an outreach and education strategy, and that's a, a five-year uh, document. Next slide, please. Goal two is natural heritage. Natural heritage conservation that preserves, enhances, and restores land of the best possible ecological health and integrity. So A is looking at our data collection of um, our habitat. B is uh, the monitoring product protocols and uh, inventory of wildlife target species. C is looking at uh, the wildlife, where it is, where it could be, it's a modeling exercise. And D is the five-year operational plans that, uh, that uh, deal with um, things such as invasive species and restoration in a five-year timeline. Next slide, please. Three is uh, re uh, recreation, so a model recreation system that provides high quality and safe experiences. A is looking at our forest bylaw and updating that and the set fines. B is uh, one of our, our most common uh, user is, uh, is a dog walker and um, just looking at off-leash dogs and um, a review and summary of, of um, that. And C again is our recreation operations plan, as well as looking at the access roads and their maintenance. Next slide. Four is our silviculture, that, that third um, um, uh, section that we deal with. And A is uh, looking at the non-conifer harvest operation. So we have conifer harvest operations, that's the, the rows generally. But then there's, uh, because of the habitat needs of savanna and woodland, uh, if you don't have certain light levels, then that community disappears. It's a globally threatened community. And this also looks at uh, if there's an invasive species outbreak and, and the trees are, are uh, dying salvage of those. We have our uh, B is our timber sale analysis and plan. C, another operational plan, this time the uh, silvicultural five-year and D is our annual harvest uh, plans and assessments. Next slide, please. Goal five 
these uh, don't specifically fall into one of those other uh, categories. They, they connect with uh, several of them or all of them. So 5A is uh, looking at our, our um, compartment boundaries um, that involves the, uh, the ecological boundaries and the forestry boundaries, making sure they, uh, they are working together and, and match. Uh, B is documenting the assets, that's the recreational uh, and access as assets. C is looking at the, the habitat that it is now and with restoration what it's going to and the mapping associated to that. D is wildfire risk. We do do prescribed burns. Those are set burns for the Savannah and Woodland uh, and tall grass prairie communities that are in, under controlled circumstances in our plan. The wildfire risk is, is something different and looking at that uh, reduction and control of that. Uh, land securement, so <clears throat> and boundary demarcation, documenting and making sure that our, our boundaries um, if there's any issues in our boundaries and, and, and signage of our boundaries. Uh, F is the uh, natural assets, uh, the green infrastructure that, that uh, the county forest is and that making sure that it's documented in the county assessment or county asset management plan. And G is a financial reserves review or reviews of or re reserves have been set up uh, for a while. So making sure that they're, uh, they're timely and effective. Next slide, please. So the next steps, we've held uh, virtual information sessions on October 19th and 21st. We have uh, an online portal joined in Northumberland uh, that has the plan and has uh, the ability to make comments on the plan. We're doing presentations to council, uh, various township councils in November and December, updating the plan based on um, all those above. And then in January and February, January slash February, we will be presenting uh, the final plan to Northumberland Council. And uh, next slide, and that's uh, that is the end. Thanks very much, Todd. Any questions from Council for Todd? Councillor Tully. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I have. I guess two questions. The first question is how much damage was done to the forest this year with gypsy moss, and excuse me for using that phrase, and secondly, driving through the forest, I noticed there was a damage. Uh, is there any plans in the coming year to spray to prevent further damage to that forest? We have, uh, yeah, through you, uh, your worship, we have um, monitored the, uh, the gypsy, or the LDD, as it's uh, uh, currently called. Uh, we have monitored that. We have specific plots in the forest uh, that we've been monitoring and we evaluated uh, before and after the LED uh, came through uh, and then uh, made the decision at, at that time not to, not to spray. Uh, we have some unique um, other uh, butterfly species and spraying would uh, be uh, would kill those. Um, so yeah, we are monitoring the situation, um, but the uh, the management plan uh, those those details get in the uh, five year conservation can come and and, and go, and some are um, some are here and others are just on the border. So that's why they're in the conservation operations plan. Uh, and your next question was regarding, can you repeat that please? Your second question, Ken. Uh, the second question was, so there's no actually plan to spray then? No, we don't have a plan to spray right now. We're, we're um, we looked at the recovery of the forest uh, of this cyclical insect, um, and we don't have plans to spray now, but we're still here and looking at using the plots, uh, we can estimate the population next year. Thank you. Councillor Redden. Thank you. Um, just a question. I think you said individuals or uh, an increased use of the um, of the forest, and I'm, I just could you comment on on some of the changes you've seen in terms of that use and the users um, in the last couple of years, particularly under COVID, 
if you've seen the same increase we've seen in uh, individuals coming out to the more rural areas. Through you, Your Worship. Uh, yes, uh, we have uh, trail counters uh, strategically placed throughout the forest so we can document. There is a lot of entries into the forest. We have some trailheads, but uh, at, when COVID hit, there was a definite, a definite spike in, in users. That doesn't get where the users are from, but we have, we have areas where um, uh, people can um, bring, um, you, you know, come in and, and park and, and just through discussions. Yeah, there was definitely an, uh, a very big spike. It's, it's come down now, um, but yeah, we have users uh, from all over uh, the county and, and beyond, but uh, you know, the exact numbers, um, we just know that uh, 100,000 users based on the, the uh, trail counters, but a definite huge spike uh, at the time of COVID. Okay, thanks. That's fine. Councillor Metcalf. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, part of your discussion here is about recreation and, and users. Um, I'm just wondering where your plan is on the future of user agreements um, within the forest. This past year or two, there's been some stumbling blocks with different user groups and what they're allowed to do within the forest. I don't know if it falls under you or not, but it, I'm just wondering how that fits into this plan as far as the future of uh, user groups and efficient uh, mitigation of, of agreements of the use of the forest. Thank you for the question through you, Your Worship. Y yeah, the, um, in the plan we talk about, about uh, trail agreements uh, uh, with user groups, but the plan is at, is at a high level. It doesn't get down into specific uh, user groups and um, that, uh, that agreement, it just uh, notes that. So yeah, we have been in discussions uh, with that updated, um, updated, updated agreement, uh, user agreement with various, various groups in the forum. Rosemary. I just wondered if, if there's any thought that the um, county would be looking at helping to promote the uh, home, a lot of people on their own property have uh, made or bought traps for the gypsy moth. And uh, last year, the big uh, concern was that there was not enough of the ferro strips, I believe they're called, to place inside the water bottle where the gypsy moths get trapped. And I was wondering if the county had considered um, helping out with that, securing the ferro strips and uh, helping to distribute those to a number of the residents who would like to participate in that to try to help protect the forest. Through you, uh, your worship, thanks uh, for the question. Yeah, we haven't, um, we have been monitoring the forest as I, as I noted and then sharing, we're on various committees, uh, the provincial government and the federal government and get updates on this species and the best management. And that's the information that we, we promote um, through our, our, our networks and to, uh, to users. So that's where we, are, um, where we are currently with LDD. Todd, did you get that question? Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so I, what I was asking was that if the uh, county was looking at helping to secure the ferro strips for, for residents, um, they were in very short supply last year, and I know a number of people were trying to get their hands on them so they could try to help out to control the gypsy moth. Um, and that, so I want to know if the county would be looking at anything like that where they could supply a bulk where people could um, get them from the county. We, uh, through your worship, we haven't looked at that, that currently, uh, no. 
would you consider it? Uh, <laughs> I'd have to uh, look into a bit more of the pheromone strips. We haven't used them in the county forest um, for trapping. Uh, we've used uh, enhanced calidar plots for monitoring um, and encourage residents to, um, with uh, the burlap uh, and uh, killing the uh, gypsy moth uh, through that method with soap and materials. But we haven't gotten, as, a, as I mentioned, we haven't gotten into the spring or, um, you know, purchasing traps for residents. Um, all methods possible. Right. And yeah. one of the most uh, effective was uh, uh, setting up a, an old plastic bottle with a ferro strip in it and mm -hmm. every day we cleaned it out and it was amazing the amount of gypsy moths we caught and we managed to save the trees around our house last year. So um, okay. I was quite impressed with them and I thought it'd be great if there was more available. They were in very scarce supply. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Um, any further questions? Uh, I'll read the resolution. Be resolved that the information presented by Todd Farrell, Northumberland County, read the forest management plan for Northumberland County Forest, be received for information. Can I get a mover and seconder for that, please? Moved by Rick, seconded by Jean. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Thanks very much, Todd. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we're now at presentations, and we have uh, Graham Peters, the Chief Librarian and CEO for the Trent Hills Public Library. Good morning, everybody. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with Council this morning. I think it's important that the municipality be apprised of what is happening at the library. And in future, this may take the form of a more formal annual report. But for now, I just wanted to take the opportunity to introduce myself and talk about some of the initiatives that Trent Hills Public Library has in the works. So I just started quite recently in July of this year. Before that, I was the CEO and director at the New Tecumseh Public Library. That's between uh, Barrie and Toronto. And before that, I was the director at a library in New Brunswick for five years, where I'm from. I'm very happy with the move to Trent Hills, and uh, I'm, I'm very enjoying it. Uh, so far. So we are in the midst of a strategic plan for the years 2022 to 2025. Um, as part of this process, we put out questionnaires to the public uh, between the months of July and November. We just shut it down and those responses uh, to the questionnaires are going to guide our strategic planning process and its priorities going forward. And those are currently being compiled. Now I'll return to that in a minute, but I just want to talk about some of the uh, future initiatives that we have in the works right now. Uh, we've got some wonderful partnerships going. We've got a partnership with uh, Bike Action Trent Hills, which is an advocacy group for uh, cycling in the community. So we're going to have bike maintenance toolkits available in each of the three library branches that can be checked out or used on site. We're going to have bike racks at each branch and we're going to have lots of workshops and programs encouraging the use of bicycles in the community. Uh, for example, we had some events in October, the ABCs of bike maintenance and the Halloween bike ride which left from the Campbellford Library. We also have a great partnership with the Sterling Musical Instrument Lending Library. Uh, we actually made a promotional video yesterday uh, promoting this service with the Hastings Ukulele Band. So watch for that video on our YouTube channel. Uh, we also have a Library of Things initiative in the works and those are items that are not books that uh, we check out to the community, for example, as infrequently used tools that can help the community save money or even introduce them to new items. For example, we recently acquired some LED light therapy lamps for seasonal affective disorder since it's very dark at the moment. 
Uh, so we'll be checking those out to the public. We're also thinking of acquiring some portable, portable Wi-Fi hotspots uh, for those people in the community without access to internet or with uh, poor connections. Um, we have a telescope available at the Hastings Library at the moment, and we're thinking of acquiring some other things like uh, GoPro cameras or virtual reality headsets, uh, gardening toolkits. The sky's the limit with this, this initiative, so we're really excited about that. Thinking more long-term, we're hoping to get some makerspace equipment into our library branches, and that's equipment that can be uh, check can be used by patrons in the libraries themselves because it's often quite expensive and complicated equipment such as 3d printers vinyl cutters uh, button makers etc we're also thinking of getting some digital media lab equipment like video cameras green screens uh, microphones etc and then having some workshops and programs related to the above from basic computer classes to seniors to youth workshops on making uh, YouTube videos or podcasts. So those are some of the um, exciting things I think we have in the works as part of our strategic planning process. Now, if members of council would like to participate in the future direction of the library, you are very welcome to do so. This is the question I asked of the public um, if the library could offer services, programs, or events that were of special interest to you and your family, what would they be? So that's a very broad question. So if anyone on council has any thoughts or ideas for what you would like to see at Trent Hills Public Library, I encourage you to forward them my way, uh, phone, email, or you can drop by my office. So that's really what I came to say this morning. If you have any questions or comments, I am here. Otherwise, I thank you, members of council, for your time this morning. Uh, thank you very much, Graham. Um, questions from council? Uh, Catherine? Uh, not so much a question, but just a, a thank you to Graham. It's been a, a, a time since he started here. Uh, several months now, and he's already definitely made his mark. And I think the um, the model for the library could be more than books. Um, when you listen to the sort of things that people can find and do, and um, I was looking at the Facebook page, and I would encourage you to look at the. There are three three um, libraries within our within our Trent Hills, and each one of them has a, a different and a very unique kind of flavor to it. But if you look at the f Facebook postings of what they're doing, last night I saw a stack of um, jigsaw puzzles coming out that people could do in the winter time. Um, there's all kinds of things videos, tapes, music, um, as well as what Graham's just told you. But I think what we're trying to do is um, really expand on what people know of as a library. And in fact, our virtual presence during COVID has been sort of a, 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 a saving for a number of individuals who have been locked in their homes, the movies that you can acquire. So I challenge each of you, and I guess both Rosemary and I are, are sitting here wondering why we had to answer five or six questions for the strategic plan when you get off easily with one. But we definitely <laughs> like to know what it is that you as counselors want to see or would like to see in the library that you haven't seen already or you've seen somewhere else. And um, we've already done the questions, so I guess we could both maybe challenge you to write something down and submit it to Graham. You don't have to give it to us, but send it in to Graham because we wanna make this um, the best little library system you could find in Eastern Ontario. And certainly Graham and his staff have us well on, on their way. Thank you, Catherine, absolutely. Thanks very much. Anyone else? Uh, I want to thank Graham. I, I, he gave me a personal tour of the uh, Hastings Library uh, on their 60th anniversary, and um, it was uh, very enlightening. Um, so I appreciated that. Uh, I'll read the uh, resolution. Be resolved that the verbal information presented by Graham Peters, Chief Librarian and CEO of Trent Hills Public Library, relibrary initiatives be received. Uh, mover and seconder, moved by Mike, seconded by Kathy. Um, all in favor? That motion is carried. Thanks, thanks again, Graham. Thank you. Uh, we're now at the um, reports of municipal officers. We have the 2022 draft municipal budget and 2022 draft water and wastewater budget. 
Um, Valerie, will you just speak to this, please? Thank you, through, through you, Your Worship. Um, we're providing a verbal update uh, for Council this morning. Uh, the 2022 draft municipal budget and 2022 draft water and wastewater budgets were presented to Council on November the 9th, and they were subsequently posted on the municipal website. Uh, budget comment submission forms were also posted on our website to allow for members of the public to provide comments and ask questions. The comment forms indicate the comments received before November the 16th will be included on the November 23rd agenda and comments received before December the 6th, 2021 will be included on the December 14th council agenda. Um, we want to advise council at this time to date, no comments have been received regarding uh, the budgets. And so next steps, uh, those budgets being the municipal budget and the water and wastewater budget will be placed on the December 14th council agendas. Uh, they will include any updates to assessment information and any other relevant information um, and we are targeting approval of those budgets on December the 14th. Thank you. Thanks, Valerie. Any questions from Council? Kathy? Was it a surprise not to have any comments submitted or is that fairly typical? Through you, Your Worship. Uh, uh, we don't typically have a lot of comments on the municipal budget. I'd say in the last several years, we might have one or two comments and some of those are to actually add more funds to the budget or, or they're mostly inquiries about different initiatives within each of the departmental areas of service. Um, so it's, it, it is a bit surprising that there aren't any comments, but it, it's not unusual. Thanks, Valerie. Anyone else? It, it might be that it's just a perfect budget and that, um, there's no need to. Uh, uh, apparently, apparently, council is not going along with that suggestion. So, um, I'll just read the uh, resolution. We resolved that the verbal information presented by Valerie Nesbitt, Director of Finance, Treasurer, read the 2022 draft municipal budget and 2022 draft water and wastewater budget be received and that the 2022 draft municipal budget and 2022 draft water and wastewater budget be brought forward to the December 14th, 2021 council meeting for approval. I have a mover and seconder for that, please. Moved by Ken, seconded by Rose. And I see no further discussion. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much. We have the um, report from Trent Hills Fire 2021-16. The Fire Department monthly report for October 21, 2021. Um, any questions on that report from Council? I'll read the, oh, Ken Tully, Mr. Tully. had gone from 39 in 2017 up to 112 in 2021. I just wondered uh, if they uh, have any information on what impact this had on the fire department because it seems like that call for service has gone up a lot and just wondered if there's anything they could point out or mention about that. You, you Mr. Mayor, I didn't hear the first part of the question. Ken, it was cut out. Okay, yes, yeah, the question, uh, Tim, was medical assists in 2017 were only 39, and this year they're up to 112, and every year that uh, category has grown, and I just wondered what impact that had on your, on your department. Uh, three years later, a lot of the changes in that have been up and down with that cheered response agreement in 2017. Right now, uh, we're actually in a lull again right now, uh, we haven't been getting too many calls. It's actually kind of leveled out again. And it's like vehicle accidents, it's just, it depends. I'll, I'll take a quicker look, uh, another look at it, and uh, I'll get you an answer, more in-depth answer to look at those totals from back then until now. Thank you. Just a comment, Tim, um, on your reports, I really appreciate looking at all the pictures in it, especially the, the training that goes on, and I just hope that's never given up. I appreciate seeing that. Thank you. 
Okay, if there's nothing further, I'll read the uh, resolution. Be resolved that the staff report Trent Hills Fire 2021-16 from Tim Blake, Fire Chief, read the Fire Department monthly report for October 2021. Be received for information. A mover and seconder, please. Moved by Rick, seconded by Kathy. All in favor? That's carried. We have report CLK. 2021-012, the amendment to the taxi cab and limousine licensing bylaw. Um, is it, does anyone wish to speak to this or we're just, is everyone good? I'll read the resolution. Be resolved with staff report CLK 2021-012 from Doug Irwin, Director of Legislative Services Clerk. Read the amendment to the taxi cab and limousine licensing bylaw be received for information. And that Article 6.01 of Bylaw Number 2007-119, being a bylaw to license, regulate, and govern taxi cab and limousine businesses and their owners, operators, brokers, and taxi drivers in the municipality of Trent Hills, be repealed, and that the appropriate bylaw be brought forward for council's consideration. Ken, you used to speak to this. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Yes, uh, I have some concerns about the 10-year limit being lifted. School buses have to be replaced after 10 years, regardless of how good a shape they're in and they're insured. And we're looking at a cab that's running, could be 24 hours a day for 10 years. They're going to be in excess of, I would say, over 300,000 kilometers on those vehicles. And to extend them beyond 10 years, uh, I'm not entirely sure that I feel the cab should be uh, allowed to be run more than 10 years on the road, given the high mileage that they probably encounter. And also, having been in many cabs in many cities, um, you also like to get in a cab that is reasonably clean or refreshed inside. And the upholstery does take wear and tear, and the carpets take wear and tear. So I have a concern about uh, extending the license beyond the 10 years and the high mileage and wear and tear on these vehicles. So that's my concern, Your Worship. Thank you. Councillor Metcalf. Thank you, Your Worship. With the report um, needing to have a, a mechanic approval, uh, I, I think that covers the ability to know whether that vehicle should be on the road or not. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm at opposite of, of what Ken has mentioned. I, I believe that uh, a certified mechanic and their report is what should uh, determine whether that vehicle stays on the road or not. There's a big difference also between taxi cabs and limousines and the amount of use that's going to be used. So if you're expecting a, uh, and I know I don't believe we have any limousine users in the municipality currently, but um, extending to have to have a, a limousine changed every 10 years is much different than having a um, minivan changed every 10 years. So. If we're going to go that way, I think we need to split this more uh, into taxi cabs and limousines. Um, but I, I, I believe that the mechanics uh, report uh, should be enough to, to say whether that vehicle should be on the road or not. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, OK, I've, I've read the resolution. Can I have a mover and seconder? Moved by Mike, seconded by Rick. Any further discussion? Call the question. All in favor? Opposed, if any? Noted by the clerk. Thank you very much. That motion carries. We are now at uh, reports of uh, council. Uh, we will start with, how about Mr. Tully? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, yeah, we already talked about the uh, Police Services Board meeting and further to that meeting, one of the questions raised was how many ride programs have been done in Trent Hills and I believe the report come back that between January 1st, 2019 and November 16, 2021, that 535 ride programs had been conducted in Trent Hill. So that was one of the questions that came out of our meeting. And 
I did attend the award ceremony virtually for the Chamber of Commerce and also watched online of the county discussion about replacing the Thompson Bridge. And uh, very thankful that we're going to have a Santa Claus parade in town on Saturday and look forward to participating in it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Redden. Thank you. Um, I guess this was sort of the month of uh, conservation authority meetings. We had a full board meeting, and I also participated in a webinar presented by the Ministry of Environment, and I believe that you have the, uh, the information provided later on in, uh, in this package. Um, and I would encourage you to read it because it very clearly outlines what the conservation authorities are going to be um, expecting and, and following through on within the next few months. And uh, each municipality is a key player in this as well. And we also have an advocacy meeting of the um, Conservation Ontario um, later this week. And uh, I may hear more about what's taking place from from um, that and um, being proposed to the government. And I, I just have to say on a personal note that it only drives home um, the seriousness and the importance of, of the work that we do on our conservation authorities, uh, particularly with flood forecasting. And um, uh, we were uh, getting our budget prepared for the Crow Valley and flood forecasting equipment is one part of that that is very important and certainly will stay in our, our capital budget. But having a sister that only just recently moved from Princeton, which was totally flooded out, um, it only serves to drive home that that um, you know the same thing could happen here easily in terms and uh, fortunately we live in a community where the the water is controlled there are safety dams but that doesn't prevent water from going where it wants to go so it's an important role that we play um, I also visited um, there it is great to see some individuals in our community taking an interest and taking the initiative to develop new businesses and I visited one on uh, this weekend called the peculiar platypus which has just opened on, I believe, Wellington Street, just adjacent to Kent School. Um, very interesting. Um, the individual said she had a choice of getting a job or making a job, and she made a job, started her own business. I think there's um, a lot of young individuals in our community and not so young that see a lot of potential in Trent Hills. And, um, and there's lots of movement going forward. So as we move out of COVID, it's good to see and uh, support those individuals. Um, and also the virtual awards were an incredible um, indication of the, um, the various services we have here. I know there were probably hundreds more that could have been nominated and should be, but it just goes to show what a wide variety we have. And as we go into our Christmas shopping, there's lots there we can support either by making purchases or getting gift cards for their services for next spring. So anyway, thank you. It was a busy month. Thanks, Kathy. Councillor Metcalf. Thank you, Your Worship. I attended the Chamber Resilience Awards virtually as well. Uh, great, great turnout of people there and uh, some good information about different businesses. Also attended the County Council meeting and again was, uh, like others have said, was pleased to see Count Council's uh, decision on the bridges and look forward to how we're going to deal with the other bridges uh, coming up, which I think at this point is almost more important than what we're doing right now. And uh, also attended uh, Autonomy Region Conservation. Thank you, Councilor Metcalf. Uh, Councilor uh, Callaher McLennan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, on November the 10th, uh, well, we participated in the council training and testing of the system here with uh, the rest of council. Also attended the Council for Seymour Community Foundation uh, AGM, and then we had a board meeting uh, shortly after the AGM. Um, November the 11th, I did follow the Remembrance Day services in Campbellford from a distance. And I have to say, I was really um, uh, impressed, one with the service. And we had four young gentlemen who were uh, working at our property. And they asked, and they weren't from Campbellford or from Trent Hills, and they asked if they could take a few minutes. So we walked down to the end of our property, which is overlooking the cenotaph, and they uh, stood there and, and stayed until the end of the ceremony. So I was, I was really impressed that 
you know, the younger generation and not when they were working, etc., that would take the time out to, uh, to remember. And uh, they all said that, no, nope, they, they never miss a Remembrance Day ceremony, and they really appreciated being able to have that time. Um, also uh, participated in a work bee for the Calumford BIA uh, for our wreaths that you see some of them now up uh, on the poles in downtown. On that was on the 14th. Um, on the 15th, attended the monthly library board meeting, and um, as was mentioned earlier, that's uh, the end of my my activities. But looking forward to the Christmas uh, parades in in our communities, and hope to participate in uh, as many as I can possibly get into. Me and my dog. Thanks, Rose. Uh, Councillor English. It on now? Yep. Okay. I uh, also attended the 1812 presentation along with Councillor Tully and Councillor Bratney at the Heritage Building, a WBA meeting, an EOTA meeting, and also attended County Council meeting. And uh, I want to thank you, Bob, for the work that you've done there. Uh, the next thing is to get this in the 2022 budget deliberations for the county. Uh, I hope you'll work hard at that. And don't be too scared by those uh, boundary bridges, uh, five of them, Mike, because I know there's going to be a report coming forward, but I'm quite confident that Trent Hills is not part of some of those bridges. So uh, anyway, good luck, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councilor Brahmi. Uh Yes, uh, I also attended the Reverend State Service in Kevilford here. And it was very appropriate that just before 11, an aircraft did a fly past that was just timed per purpose, purposely. And uh, it was brought back the moments of just what did happen. I recall back having uh, a Dutch family live with us in the, the 50, early 50s. And of course, when the Trenton Air Base was flying aircraft around our area, there's a little boy younger than I was and he would just tear off to the house, scared tremendously from the aircraft flying because he, he lived through the, the bombings in, in Holland. <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> get back to my topic here. Uh, attended the PSB meeting, uh, very pleased to watch the county council meeting in process. Uh, Lower Trent, uh, we got one, one of a few hiccups coming in the Lower Trent. To replace the uh, logs in the Warkworth Dam, it, the, like everything else, its costs have skyrocketed, but this is more than just skyrocketed. So, <laughs> as Archie would say, it's over the moon. Uh, the volunteer appreciation at the fire hall is well done and give people an opportunity to see how efficient and beautiful building we have. But support of all those people that did work for through the the vaccination process uh, i also was part of the webinar on conservation and really appreciated the united uel presentation in the heritage building uh, the gentleman that put it forward is he's really died into it and uh, speaks with his heart i guess that's the comments i was at thank you Thanks very much, Gene. Um, for myself, um, I attended the um, the uh, Chamber Awards and, and um, uh, just wanted to say what a great job uh, Nancy Don and, and Laurie Shewitt did uh, on uh, setting it up and presenting it. I thought it was um, very well done for, um, uh, for, for the Chamber. Um, the, uh, I'm looking forward to the parades. Um, did attend the Calvo Seymour Community Foundation, the AGM, and their and the, and their meeting. Uh, November the 11th, I was uh, in in Hastings, um, uh, and I was very pleased because um, uh, we had the the school come down to our uh, cenotaph, and it was great to see um, 
uh, see the kids and um, uh, get back to uh, about halfway normal. I guess we, uh, we we didn't have everything we normally have on November the 11th, but it was was great. I also attended on Saturday the volunteer appreciation at the fire hall, and um, uh, that was great to see the people and um, to um, just to get to talk and 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 realize what what they did and and uh, and thank them for it because. Uh, um, uh, John had some numbers which I don't have in my head, but uh, you know it was like 6,000 volunteer hours. I think was in in the neighborhood of what was uh, what was done for the clinics and, and continuing. There were you know we're now having them every couple of weeks, but um, it's great and uh, just encourage everyone to uh, get that shot and get the third one. Now the kids can uh, can get theirs and maybe we'll get back to being. Uh, halfway normal. So thank you very much everyone for your updates. Uh, we're now at the uh, consent agenda. Announcements of interest to the public um, accessing these services during the municipal op uh, office renovation. Uh, notice of the public meeting, uh, the building related fee schedule revisions is on December the 7th, 2021. And notice of the public meeting cannabis production and processing is also December the 7th, 2021. Black Cat reports. We have concession road 13 on September 2021, the Trent River Road on October 2021, and Wingfield Road on 2021. Um, we have correspondence from the uh, provincial funding for the conservation authorities. And um, we have from um, the Ministry of the Environment, the Conservation Authorities Act, phase one resolutions. Be resolved that staff recommendations with respect to consent agenda items 9B to 9D be adopted as printed. Can I get a mover and seconder for that, please? Moved by Gene. Seconded by Rick. Any discussion on any of those items? All in favor? That's carried, thank you. Uh, we have no communications or petitions. Um, bylaws be resolved at bylaw number 2021-108, bylaw number 2021-110, bylaw number 2021-111. Be read a first, second, third time passed, properly signed and sealed by the clerk and mayor. Can I get a mover and seconder for that, please? Moved by Rose. Second by Mike. Um, any discussion? Uh, Mr. Tully. Yes, how do I, I'm not in favor of 2021-11-11, uh, uh, so I just wondered uh, if we can do that separate from the other ones if you're looking for approval. Yes, no problem. So we will do, uh, uh, th this motion will cover bylaw number 2021-11. 108 and bylaw number 2021-110. Um, mover and seconder on that. All in favor? Oops, oh, sorry, Kathy. I just have a question um, on the community care. Um, it talks about um, members of a regional transportation committee. Do, did I miss or are there individuals named? didn't see any names, but who, who sits on that committee? Are they public representatives or staff representatives, or do we know? I'm just curious who brings information sort of from this area. Um, I'm not entirely sure. It would be a community care initiative. So the rural transportation is, as you know, managed by them, which is the C agreement. So it's not, um, uh, there's no Trent Hills representation in terms of not a, not public currently sense. any not currently yeah okay no just curious I can I can contact them and find out mm -hmm. thanks uh, Kathy I could also uh, comment the um, the county is uh, putting together um, a committee to uh, I guess source out all the different transportation initiatives in the county um, there's been some talk at the county regarding uh, Metro links and go buses and all the rest of it, but um, uh, the, they're, they're going to look at what each municipality has and maybe a way of coordinating so that uh, uh, we can have a, a little better uh, 
cohesion in our uh, the bus systems that are including our own. Um, so that, that's just something that has come up at the last council meeting. Just to follow up on that, if I may. I'm, I, yeah, I am on. Um, no, I, I think that's an excellent idea. Um, over the, I would say over a number of decades since Community Care first got their first venture van, um, we also had some bus services. The Ames bus service came through and then there were some others. Uh, part of it has been a, a licensing issue, um, but since then Community Care has done an excellent job in sort of bringing the county together from both ends. It's just, I, I agree there needs to be some cohesiveness or at least an understanding of Brighton seems to be more focused towards Quinty, then you have Cobra Port Hope, and then Trent Hills, but the connecting links and as things move, uh, you know, how do we get out of the area and on a regular schedule? And I guess um, the other question would be, at one time we did have sort of a routine uh, connection of little bus routes around and we had some signs put up and I'm not sure that that has really um, worked as well as they would have liked to. So it, it is important. And I was just curious, you know, if there are local representatives or local users, as in the past we had a transportation committee that brought those issues forward, whether it's the accessibility committee or a different one. But it, it is timely and um, as we move out of COVID, people want to move around. So I'm all in favor of what you can do. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Kathy. I, I, um, I think we, um, I think we were uh, moving forward with uh, community care when COVID hit. Uh, our numbers were starting to increase on our bus routes, and um, and it was it was I think starting to work uh, locally, and and um, we were also um, um, you know working with going to Coburg and, and that sort of thing. So I, I think uh, the, the pandemic kind of uh, squashed all those things, but hopefully we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see a comeback soon. Um, just to follow up on that, um, the Rural Ontario Institute and Roma have done some considerable work as well on rural transportation. And in fact, Dan Borowick currently sits on that board and they do have some really interesting um, documentation and stats from other counties, primarily in Western Ontario, but a lot of really good initiatives. And um, so there's lots of information around, so I'll look forward to seeing what they come up with. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, do we approve that last motion for the first two bylaws? All in favor? That's carried. And uh, the next motion would be um, be resolved that bylaw number 2021-111 be read a first, second, third time passed properly signed and sealed by the clerk and mayor. Can I get a mover and seconder for that, please? Moved by Kathy, seconded by Rose. All in favor? Opposed? Noted? Thank you very much. There are no notice of motions and we have no closed session items. Confirmation bylaw be resolved at bylaw number 2021-112, a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the council meeting held on Tuesday, November the 23rd, 2021. Be read a first, second, third time, passed properly signed and sealed by the clerk and mayor. May I get a mover and seconder for that, please? Moved by Mike. Seconded by Rose. Pulling teeth. Uh, all in favor? That's carried. And a motion to adjourn. Moved by Rick. Seconded by Ken. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much. <laughs>